Hello and welcome to the realm of engineering lore, a place where we figure out where our technology is headed and where it came from. In this first video, we want to start from our most loved and used devices and see where they are leading us. In the last few decades, our society has experienced a complete revolution in its customs and habits. This revolution has been led by a boost in electronics and computer science technologies. Microchips have made it possible to integrate incredibly complex machines in just a few square millimeters of area. Then we were able to develop complex digital machines, which we commonly call computers, but actually they include smartphones and tablets. These devices are able to elaborate in a fraction of a second an incredible amount of operations. All this stunning from an enormous quantity of data constantly generated and shared all over the world. This incredible trend does not seem to stop, as new technologies are still waiting to be mature enough to change our everyday life once again. I am talking about artificial intelligence, for instance, that is just now enabling computer vision for fast robot or drone navigation, or for Boston Dynamics robotic dog, for example. But also, uh, AI is useful for traffic monitoring developed for autonomous vehicles, such as Tesla cars, or facial recognition. Apple has implemented in a device as small as an iPhone an incredible system. All these technologies were developed with computation power advancement following Moore's law. The number of transistors, hence their computer power, has steadily doubled each year. However, due to quantum physics, the law might not hold up for much longer. Not in the same way. In this video, we're going to talk about a completely new idea for electronics that might actually allow Moore's law to remain valid, a new device that in the future might help boost our computer specs or even revolutionize the way they work. The Memristor. But first, let's start from a bit of history. This device was theorized in 1971 by this man, Professor Leon Chua from the University of California. He looked at how the electrical variables were connected to each other defining three main elements the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor, but he noticed that, due to symmetry, a combination was actually missing. So, for the sake of completeness, Chua proposed the definition of this fourth element as the variation of the magnetic flux over the variation of charge. The computation showed that the device actually acts like a resistor with a value of resistance dependent on time and an internal state variable. It's very complex, but we're gonna break it down a little. The first real device to behave like a memristor was physically realized just in 2008 by the HP labs on a thin film of titanium dioxide, proving that the theory could actually work. Nowadays, many universities and companies are working actively to develop devices able to work uh, as a memristor, or at least in a similar manner. For this reason, we have several different physical implementations. Some of them are based on redox chemical reactions, reversible, and electronically controlled. Some others are based on purely electronics phenomena, like in electron trapping devices, others on the physical properties of the device, like its crystal in an amorphous phase, and in this case, PCM memories are noteworthy. Uh, we won't get too much in the details of these complex physical descriptions for all these devices, as they require a video each, but if you're interested, leave a comment below. The idea at the base of this phenomena is either a flux of charges or an applied voltage changes some physical property of the material in which it is flowing, hence changing the material conductance and resistance. So, how does uh, a memristor actually work and how can we use it? So, how does a memristor actually work? Well, let's spend some words on the characteristic graph of this device that describes the, the properties that can be exploited to change the way our whole electronics actually work. To do so, we will use a simple simulation tool that you can find online, I'll leave the link in the description. This is how an ideal memristor works. We can see that when we apply a positive voltage, a current is flowing across our device, those are the little dots uh, moving uh, upwards, and at the same time, the resistance is going gradually from an upper maximum volume to a minimum one, as plotted in the lower part of the simulation. While applying a reverse value of voltage, we are doing exactly the opposite. We are increasing the resistance gradually, again up to maximum value. These two maximum and minimum values of resistance can be considered equivalent to our digital bits 1 and 0, 
instead of high voltage and low voltage, now we have high resistance and low resistance. In this second example, we see what happens if during a transition, uh, our voltage suddenly drops to zero. As we can see, the resistance is not changing anymore, but at the same time, it is not at its maximum level nor its minimum. It is actually fixed at an intermediate level. What we have now shown is an analog tuning of the resistance. We are practically able to select a precise value for our device and then use it in an analog circuit that require the adjustment of resistance value. It is important to underline that luckily memory stores won't change their resistance value if the voltage applied is not enough. So with low signals we can use the memory store like a classical resistor, but without interfering with the program value of it. So memory stores are basically memories and we are particularly interested in them because they are quick, dense and non-volatile. In fact, the fundamental feature for this kind of component is that it has a high data density, uh, non-volatility and uh, uh, both endurance and short read time. There are different memory stiff devices that seem to fulfill all these requirements. Intrinsically, a memory store is a simple two-terminal device which can be shrunk to nanometric dimensions and then realized near other components on many layers, one over the other, reaching a very high data density. Moreover, some particular memory stores have been demonstrated to be capable of having their resistance accurately tuned in order to obtain an analog memory. In other words, they could also bring the possibility to store more than one bit in a single elementary cell. They are also intrinsically non-volatile, which means that, differently from our RAM, they can keep the data stored even without being plugged to a power line, which also means that future computers might get completely rid of loading times and turn on and turn off routines. But why are quick, dense and non-volatile memories actually re uh, researched and uh, how can memory-restive devices revolutionize the computing and artificial intelligence? Well, in normal computers and smartphones that we commonly use in our houses, uh, well, they use uh, a simple structure that's called the von Neumann architecture. These machines consist of three main parts. There is the CPU, or the processing unit, where operations are actually computed, a memory intended as uh, the random access memory that feeds information to the CPU and storage devices like uh, solid state drives and hard disks that feed information to the RAM. All this data is moved around over the bus that links uh, uh, memory and processor and uh, it is basically the highway. The paradigm of computation is uh, bringing up a really big issue for modern computers. Processors are really fast and they have to wait between requesting information from this low data storage that then has to be sent out to the memory chip, travel across the data bus and finally reach the processor that in the meanwhile has wasted computation cycles. This is called the von Neumann bottleneck or more in short the memory wall. Another big issue for modern computers is that the clock frequency that should be considered as the rate at which operations are executed by the CPU. In fact, a higher frequency should in theory be desired. Nevertheless, higher frequencies imply also a higher switching rate for digital circuits corresponding to a much higher power density leading to thermal issues. For this reason, we have not seen processors increase their operational frequency hugely in the last decade, reaching the highest values available 4 and 5 GHz without resorting to exotic cooling systems such as liquid nitrogen. You can see that the latest devices from Intel use a cryogenic cooler. That's a bit over-engineering it. But nowadays, all kinds of processing units are trying to increase their performance using a higher number of actual cores working in parallel instead of increasing the clock frequency. Think of server CPUs that have an incredible number of cores, up to 64 in AMD's Epic line, but at relatively low clock speeds, around 3 GHz. Memory stiff devices can help to solve these issues, completely changing how our computer works. The idea is to completely avoid the transmission of data from memory to processor and vice versa. In fact, it has been widely demonstrated that logical num or numerical operations can be performed keeping the data stored on the memory store and just letting them interact with each other. There exists an enormous quantity of different prototypes, most of them coming under the name of in-memory computing. As the name implies, 
All these uh, solutions are aimed to obtain uh, computation directly on the memory chip, avoiding time-consuming data transfer and, in some cases, reaching another desirable feature. The activity of the chip just in the moment and on the precise area where data is requested and saved, reducing in this way the power dissipation and heating of the chip. These in-memory ar architectures are very important for all data-centric operations like big data analysis and machine learning. In particular, talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, memory stores have catched the interest of the scientific community because their behavior is incredibly similar to the synapses mechanisms in our brains. Our biological neural networks work thanks to billions of neural cells interconnected by even more synapses, thousands of synapses for each neuron. These neurons interact with each other through uh, electrical pulses of, of different magnitude. This process has inspired a particular kind of modern artificial neural networks, which takes the name of spiking neural networks, and can be realized in a very power-efficient way using memory save devices. This particular class of in-memory chip takes the name of neuromorphic circuits, where memory stiff devices are interconnected to each other like neurons in our brain. A great example is the IBM Synapse microchip, able to quick and efficient multi-target detection in live videos. So memory stores are a new tech and many universities are currently developing them. While it could take a while for consumer-grade memory stiff computers, we hope to have hyper interest in this new upcoming technology. This video was written by an electronics engineer and it has been read, drawn and edited by an aerospace engineer. If you have any interest in any new weird technology, let us know in the comments below. Next time we will talk about how space access for the public might be closer than we think and without involving risky rockets. If you are interested, leave a comment below, like the video and share it. See you next time. Bye bye.